guys, I'm going to channel me Prachi and I'm going for the chocolate factory experience. So there are two options. There's one which is the normal entrance and then there's another one which is the truffle rolling. So you can basically make your own chocolates inside. So I'm going to show you what this other thing looks like and I think it was um, 30 pounds with the chocolate making experience, 25 without it and it's a student discount as well. Anyway, check the prices, I'm not really sure. And I'll show you what this place looks like and bye guys, see you inside. Chocolates. Yeah. Yes, I'd be a little bit worried if you didn't, right? And so I'll introduce myself. Hello, and my name is Katie, and I'm one of the tour guides here at York's Chocolate Story. Now today I'm going to be taking you all on a little bit of a journey throughout the history of chocolates. And if you're really good, you might even get to make some at the end as well, which I think is the best bit. And today we're going to be making some chocolate lollies and also do some triple rolling as well. And okay, we're going to talk about the history first. And we've all come up in this lift today, guys. And this lift is a little bit like a Doctor Who's TARDIS, believe it or not, because we've done some time travelling. And we've come all the way back to the 1800s, over 200 years ago. Now, if you were to all walk around the streets of York at this time, you're not going to see a Claire's Accessories or a Disney store, I'm afraid. But what you are going to see is a thriving market. Tons of market goers, market stalls, and children running about playing, dressed in rags. And something you would also see that's related to chocolate bars, because that's why you're here, isn't it? It's just behind me. And this, guys, is Roundtree and Sons Grocer's Shop, and it's situated at 28 Pavement Street. Now, you can go see the shop in real life today, if you really fancied it. It's located just down the bottom of the shambles. We've got a photo of that famous street here. Has everyone been down the shambles already today? Yes, I suppose the most famous street in York, if you haven't, it's right next to the museum. It looks a lot like Harry Potter's Diagon Alley, doesn't it? And it's filled with Harry Potter shops nowadays. Capitalise on that. <laughs> but if you want to see this shop, go right down to the end and you should eventually find it on the opposite road. But it's not a fruit and veg shop anymore, sadly. It has now been preserved as a pizza lot. Yeah, I'm pretty miserable if you ask me. But if you want some pizza, I don't know, and go take a quick look because there's a fancy plaque pressed onto the side and it goes into detail of how Joseph Browntree, the owner, acquired it. Because as you can probably guess, this shop, if we've got a replica of it, it must be pretty famous. It was actually the birthplace for probably two of the biggest names in the UK chocolate world. Maybe below Cadbury's, but we'll just push over that. Um, now their names, they were Joseph Browntree Jr and Henry Isaac Grantree, the sons of Joseph Senior. And when they were teenagers, they worked in their dad's shop selling fruit and vegetables. But they also worked with these people here in the red sign, and that was their close family friends, the Chooks. Now the Chooks, they had a shop just down the road. They also sold fruit and vegetables. But the Chooks, they also happened to be cocoa powder sellers. And they were some of the very first cocoa powder sellers to exist ever, not just in the UK, but most of Western Europe. I think it's pretty cool that that started right here in York. Now both families, they sold this cocoa powder together for a little while and then they started to invent some chocolate products. Now you might think the first chocolate product to exist in the UK was a chocolate bar, right? But it wasn't. Does anyone know what the first chocolate product was? A drink. No, it was a drink, yes, well done. Um, but it wasn't called hot chocolate back then, guys. And it was called Rock Cocoa. Um, now, rock cocoa was rock hard back then, obviously, um, hence its name. And when it was mushed together in a brown ball, melted into warm milk, and it really didn't have that much sugar in, and it often had little hard bits of raw chocolate inside, and they would float around in the top of your cup. So, yes, I'm not selling it well, am I? Um, but back then, trust me, it was pretty great. Everybody was drinking it. Because back then, the water was so dirty, you couldn't just turn the tap on and drink it. And um, so, this rock cocoa, it was a great alternative. And it was because of the popularity of this drink that the Roundtree family, they actually decided to take a huge gamble. They saved up all of their money as a family and they bought the entire chocolate side of the Chooks family business completely outright off them to make their own of it. And as you can probably guess, that was a pretty good gamble. Um, they went on to make millions of pounds in the future and they produced so many famous chocolates and sweets. And it all started in this shop here. You've got things like Kit Kats, Aeros, Fruit Pastels, Smarties, Caramac, Polo Mids, Yorkie, Black Magic, honestly the list goes on. There's so many famous things that started in the shop. Now you might be thinking, the Chooks and Prosperity. A handful of seeds thrown as if from heaven, the food of the gods, 
as dark as the Central American soil which nurtures it, as rich as the men who will sell it, a gift from paradise. Coco. Such gifts are costly. As the cocoa crops flourish, the seeds of war take root. Warrior Aztecs all their own their peaceable man neighbors, greedy for power, for land, for cocoa, this gift greater than gold. Cocoa brought the Aztecs health, fertility, and long life. Their mighty emperor, Montezuma, drank up to 50 cups a day. He fired their love of women and financed their trade. On it they built their empire. Civilizations rose and fell. Men killed and died for this bit of water. Chocolato. Chocolate. Adventurer. Landed in the new world 500 years ago in his murderous quest for fame and fortune. Covered chocolate. His conquest concluded, he loaded his ships with cocoa beans and returned to Spain with his precious cargo. The recipe for chocolate passed to the Spanish court where it was guarded for 100 years. But such secrets cannot be kept. <laughs> and sweetened with sugar from the Caribbean, it passed from Spain to France, and from there to Italy, Holland, Germany, and, in the 1650s, to England. The tide that flows through England's ports and rivers, along the Humber and the Ouse, to York. It is traded by the city's merchants, brewed in her cocoa houses and enjoyed by her people. Stolen from an ancient world, cocoa once again sows the seeds of the future in York. And not just in York either, because you've got the fries in Bristol, and you've got the Cadbury's in Birmingham as well. And they're all building their own businesses and making their own chocolate bars. But we are in York today, aren't we? So in the next room, we're gonna have a little look at all the families that lived here back in the day, and then all about the chocolates and the sweets that they made. So I know we've mentioned the round trees, but there's two other families as well. Now I wonder if you can guess who they are. So once you're ready, guys, if you'd like to call any room, and then the chemists and the pharmacists too. And they're all living here in New York, destined to find their fame and here to tell you about that today, we have our main family families. So here in the centre we have the very famous Joseph Brantley Jr. But on the left we have our... <coughs> Excuse me. It were my little grocer's shop that started the whole thing off. Round about 300 years ago, chicken tea and coffee and cocoa into your club river. Weren't all played fair in mind. Those merchant adventures. Took seven years to be free from all trouble and crimes. Oh, how would I to know I needed a license? But still, as a woman, I built a thriving business to hand on. And this here, guys, is Mary Chute, and she was not going to wait for an interruption from me, was she? But as she said, she first on with her sister and her nephew, and then 137 years later, yeah, she passed it on to this guy. And I mentioned him in the first room, his name is Henry Isaac Roundtree. And worked for Jukes, knew the business well. Great ideas I had, great ideas. Of course, it wasn't until my brother Joseph joined to help that things really started to take off the round trees. You needed more than a bit of help. Then we could grow the company beyond chocolate. See, 
we hired the French expert who brought out our famous pastilles, moved from Tanner's Boat to Haxby Road, a great success, put the company on a sound footing so we could look after our workers with paid holidays, health care, even provided them with pensions. Oh, look. I beg your pardon? Introduce you the formidable Mary Ann Craven. Brown tree, give us an ant up. Now, Craven's a little bit less famous, but really important though, nonetheless. Right. You don't want to make topic, unbooks, and fake arms paid that being soft. I lost my husband and father inside a year and ended up running two businesses. Ah, the children to bring up and all. There's always someone. Who will try and take advantage of a five foot tall widow. Well, not while I've got a chair tall enough to see across the factory, they won't. I kept a keen eye on how straight the stripes were in the young books. And you, Cravens, was a bigger name as those two, you know. I know, always don't worry, we all have our own stories to tell. Now, why don't we hear from Mrs. Terry next? No, not you, Frank. You found my first. Well, I started off as an apothecary, a chemist, then I met the wife, went into her family's confectionery business. Sugaring pills was good practice for making sweets. Soon, Terry's was sending confectionery from Bishop Fort Road in York right across the north by railway. New ideas and technology. That's what Terry and Sons is all about. Hey, Frank? Quite right, Grandfather. New ideas, like Father's steam-powered chocolate factory, <laughs> or our famous chocolate apple, and our rather more successful chocolate orange. Do you like the from fruit? We do, madam. Have you not heard about Terry's old gold? Well, if it's bright ideas you want. What about Ralphie's famous black magic and Kit Kat? Catch on Cravens, French Now please, can we not? And Ralphie's put the bubbles into arrows. And the holes into pomos. Selling holes. Now that's good business. Oh, Delicious sugar-crusty York fruits. Eh? How about them? And made on books. That's what you want. On books. Ah. You all understand how we, the founding families, started something very special here in York. Famous confectionery that's known and loved by millions of people around the world. And there are still some very fine confectioners, large and small, here in the city today. York really is the capital of chocolate. That's quite right, James. There's so many famous chocolates and sweets all made here. And you've got one in your bag to take home with you, and that's your and then that's Folly to Street, which was made by Matthew's Hodge, but it was meant went on to be made by the Round Trees. But so here's my chocolate bar that they just mentioned. It's actually one of the most famous to be bought and sold across the whole world. So I wonder if you can guess which one that was. We're going to talk about it though, you guess it. The next room. So, and as you can see, we've got loads of cool photos, all documents in history, the different people that used to work in the Round Trees, Terry's and Craven's factories. We have two replicas of the uniforms from the Roundtree's factory, and we also have the clock from the Terry's factory. You might recognise this because it's used on all the after-age packaging. So yes, do take a look. But we do like to switch up which parts of history we chat about in here, just to keep it fresh. And this year we're celebrating a very famous chocolate bar. And it was named the most influential brand of all time in Guinness Book of World Records, apparently. And that was three years running. So, Does anyone know which chocolate bar I'm talking about? Can you guess? Where was I kicked down the slide? You are correct, yes. And so, it was the same to you guys. Have a break. What do you say? Have a good day, Please, yes, I'm in the room, guys. <laughs> Love that place. Thanks, Logan. Thanks ever so much. And now that's Logan. It was actually written on Ruben's and by this guy here, with his pile. And his name is Mr. George Harris. And he was the marketing director at Brown Trees back in the 1930s. Now, back then, Brown Trees were doing pretty shockingly. They were almost bankrupt, and that's because a certain Mr. Cabaret was doing way, way better. <laughs> so we need to think really quickly and try and invent something brand new and different. And in 1935, he invented the Round Trees Chocolate Crisp. 
Very long wordy name that. It was eventually changed to the Kit Kats. I think pretty good job. It has a much better ring to it in my opinion. But it was one of the first bars in the UK to have a filling inside with the wafer. And now we take that sort of thing for granted. It was one of the first bars to use bright fancy packaging with the red colours. Because back then we used to just wrap it all up in brown paper. Pretty boring. But the thing that set it apart from most chocolate bars at the time was that it was because it was the cheapest bar ever to be produced. Produced. It started out at just 10 pence per bar and it was even marketed as a working man's chocolate to take you pack up for lunch because back then you had to be at least middle class to be able to afford chocolate. And I think it's fantastic that Kit Kat was one of the first chocolates that made it accessible to absolutely everyone. That's great. And now it's known all over the world. See, I did not think Kit Kat was that popular because honestly when I first started working here that's what I thought. I was quite surprised. I literally just think of Kit Kat as a chocolate biscuit. Maybe it's because I just tend to ignore it in the biscuit aisle. I don't really like it that much personally, but don't tell them on that. <laughs> now, if you're the same and you're a little bit surprised, the reason why Kit Kat is so popular, it's not just because of the UK where it was invented, it's actually because of a different country. And in this place, there has been over 300 different flavours of Kit Kat. Does anyone know about that? It's Japan. Yes, it is Japan. Well done. Have you guys seen any of the flavours they've got? Yeah, there's, there's loads of them. I could, I could go on forever listening to them. I'll tell you some. So, they brought all over to the UK, matcha green tea. Has anyone tried that? Yeah, yeah. what do you think? Was it alright? Yeah, I really, really liked it. Really cool. It's, it's all green and white. It looks beautiful. And in Japan, though, you've got even more. So, you've got a strawberry cheesecake Kit Kat. Yes, yeah, so they do a wasabi one, really, really spicy. And um, they do a soy sauce Kit Kat. Um, they did a load of Western dishes. They discontinued them now. But they used to do a hot dog Kit Kat. A pizza Kit Kat, a hamburger Kit Kat, pizza Kit Kat, and did some fishy ones too. So they did a black squid ink Kit Kat, and they even did a smoked salmon Kit Kat. Now that one apparently had real pieces of dried fish embedded in the wafer. So yeah, and by the looks of some of your faces, all the parts I can see anyway, don't think you fancy trying that. <laughs> but if you ever go over to Japan, honestly do look out for it. Apparently they have just huge shops dedicated to Kit Kat alone. It's crazy. You might be wondering why then? Why is it so popular? And the reason, might surprise you, it's actually a bit of a fluke. So Kit Kat just so happens to sound a lot like the Japanese phrase Kitakatsu. I pronounce that terribly in my accent, but that sounds a lot like Kit Kat, doesn't it? And in Japanese, that translates to good luck or win for sure. So it became a huge craze over there to give them out as a little good luck charm at birthdays or weddings even. And if you ever go into a Japanese example, no idea why you would, but if you did, you would notice a lot of students even happen to have a little uh, Kit Kat on the side of their desks to wish them good luck. And there's even a little place on the back of each Kit Kat to write a little message to your friends. I think that's really, really sweet. Yes. In Thailand, Kit uh, uh, means thing. So the campaign that they downstairs and learn in a little more detail how all these Kit Kats are made in the factories. Or rather just a normal chocolate bar to be honest. Because I'm sure even though we do eat chocolate all the time, well I know that I do, I don't think people realise how long it actually takes just to make one bar from start to finish. So we're going to do that now. So is everyone here okay? in our very fancy factory and you'll get to make some chocolate in real life soon that's probably why you can smell it in the air but we're going to start here first and before we start in the factory we're going to have to find some cocoa beans from somewhere aren't we now if you take a look at this photograph here we get a picture of some big green cocoa pods being grown in africa now those pods they take about six whole months to grow to their full size they're not that big though they're about the size of a rugby ball. And inside every single cocoa pod, you should find a load of cocoa beans. And there's about 30 to 40 in each pod. And I'll show you some. So they're scooped out of the center of this, but they're scooped out with like a white fleshy pulp. It looks a bit like a banana when you open this up. And once they're scooped out, they're left under banana leaves to ferment and dry out for about 10 whole days. Because believe it or not, this pod here, it's actually a fruit, but it's one of the few fruits that we tend to eat the seeds in the Western world way more than we actually do the fleshy pulp inside. But I guess because of that, you could technically say the chocolate is one of your five a day. So there you go. <laughs> All right, guys. So once these beans 
have been dried out. They're sent over to the UK in huge sacks like these. And when we receive the beans in the factories, they're going to have to be roasted just to get rid of any bacteria. But when you roast them, it makes the outsides of the shells really dry and brittle. And that makes them absolutely perfect for our very first stage of chocolate making in our factory. So, could I get a volunteer from this side to turn this handle? You're right to do it. You're right to grab some hand sanitizer first, though. Thank you ever so much. So, once you're ready, if you're right, just grab that handle and turn it as fast as you possibly can. That's perfect. So, keep going. Wonderful. So, what you're doing here, think of it like a big chocolate tumble dryer. It rattles these beans together at really high speeds. Big fans come on, and the fans blow all the bits of the shell away. Thank you very much. Now, if you were to have done that in real life, this is what you would have made. And you've got some in your bags to take home with you. And these are called cocoa nibs, or cacao nibs, if you want to be fancy. It's just crushed up raw chocolate. Has anyone tried these before? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, and I quite like them, but they are quite bitter, a little bit like Marmite. Some people love them, some people hate them. They do not taste like a chocolate bar just yet, let's put it that way. Um, but if you do like the flavour, you can buy them in Holland and Barrett, and they're considered a health food because of all the fibre inside, and you can sprinkle them on porridge and smoothies. But to be honest, I prefer my chocolate with a lot more sugar and milk in. Cool, thank you. So, we have these nibs. Well, because they're so gritty, and we're going to need to now grind them up into a smooth paste. So, can I get someone to do this for me? Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry. And then, just the same as before, just grab it and turn it as fast as you can. Lovely. So, what we're doing now, guys, is we're grinding these nibs on the huge rollers. They look a lot bigger than this in the factory. And what comes out on the other side, we've got a thick, sticky brown paste. Okay. So this paste, I'll show you some in real life. This is it. And again, you've got some in your bag you to press it even more. So if you're alright to do that, is that okay? Thank you. Get them out. I'm just going to put the And once you've done that, you grab the handle. And just press it down with all your strength. Down with that way. And keep it pressed. Perfect. So what we're doing now is we're just compressing this chocolate in the factories under huge weights. And what happens is it separates it out into two different ingredients. So at the top we've got cocoa solid, which is a crumbly powder, and then at the bottom, if you didn't see, we have a fat called cocoa butter. You've probably heard of that. Thank you very much. Now, you might be thinking, you just said that was 100% chocolate, the darkest chocolate in the world, so why do we separate it out in the factories? The reason is, it's just that different chocolate bars have different percentages of the two. So a really good example of this is white chocolate. Anyone a fan of white chocolate? Yeah, it's one of my favourites, some say no. Really. Yeah, it's a bit like Mama, it's really sweet. But the reason why white chocolate is, um, is white and not brown is because it only contains cocoa butter. It doesn't actually have any of the real chocolate, the powder in it whatsoever. So technically what you are eating when you eat white chocolate, guys, it is just fat milk and sugar mixed together, I'm afraid. But that's why it tastes so good, all right? So don't worry yourselves, I eat it all the time. And milk chocolate though, that's brown. It has a mix of the two. And then the darker the chocolate, the more powder it has and the less fat it has. So that is why dark chocolate is better for you. But again, just eat whichever one you like then. Mm. You want the good ones, all right? Okay, so we've pressed them and we've separated them. So now we need to mix them all together again. So I'll do this one if that's okay. Um, it's a bit temperamental, this. So what we're doing now is just mixing all our ingredients together. So in this big bowl, we already have cocoa solids, cocoa butter, Again, different percentages dependent on what we're making. And I've just added in a little bit of sugar, and I'm going to give that a big mix. And then we need to add one more ingredient. What's missing? Milk. Yeah, so we're going to have that now. But I have to say, when I press this button, the animation of this milk going in is a little bit of a lie to fib. And that's because we cannot add liquid milk to chocolate because the water in the milk and the oil in the butter would separate. Think of a balsamic vinegar, the oil sits on the top. So instead we have to add something called milk crumb. That's the technical name. It's essentially just a dehydrated form of milk powder. It's very yellow, crumbly, and it really doesn't look that appetizing. So that's usually why you don't see it on the advertisements and you see the beautiful glass pouring in. But trust me, it's a lie. It doesn't look like that in the factories at all. 
All right, so we put, put all of those in, and you only need four ingredients. Chocolate really is that simple. And we mix them all together for not just a few seconds, like this animation, but for a minimum of three whole days. Yeah, I know that sounds a bit ridiculous, but you figured out it really does take that long to grind all those ingredients down and make them beautifully smooth. The longer you mix them as well, the shinier it is when it sets inside the mold. All right, so we mixed it for three whole days, technically. So there's only one last thing we need to do now, and that's squeeze all of our mixture into our chocolate mold. Do you have the finishing our bar off for me? Thank you ever so much. You ready to grab the handle, squeeze all of our mixture in. And then lift it up. Oh, very, very nearly. You just don't feel it and it gets still rejected. And oh. another go. You press it down. And then look at really quick.
Santa Maria or Champagne or Jägermeister or whiskey, you get the idea. Um, one more we, we uh, did do a baked bean and marmite ganache, which I wouldn't really recommend to anybody to be frank, but it just shows you what you can do to create it. Liquid and chocolate So I'm going to pipe over the, uh, the bottom of the chocolate before this capping off. That's going to seal everything in. I'm just going to smooth that chocolate down. Make sure everything's completely full. Because again, if there's any air bubbles, any bits of moisture, well, that's going to rot the filling. And as you see, you need a fruit based ganache that can destroy our shelf life for a couple of weeks to a couple of days. Obviously, not ideal for us. Scrape down the excess again, back into the tank, like so. And we get it. As the top is set, pulls away from the mould and it shrinks a little. So what happens is, you come out, the one, two, maybe even three or four taps. The point is, you come out in one go, and none of them have stuck to the inside of the mould. But what is better is we have an absolutely gorgeous glass-like glass on the outside, just about to see. There we have it, freshly made chocolates, all for you. So what is easy as ever, ladies and gentlemen. So, we have yours actually pre bags and we did that just a bit of time. So I'll call out your group numbers. There was uh, one person on the road, wasn't there? And there was another person on the road. It was just a one, pop over. It should be enough for about three each. There we go. And also the rest of the two. So there we go. It was an amazing experience. I really enjoyed the truffle making and the entire history and the story and this place was really, really, really nice. And the way they organized everything was amazing as well. It was so much fun and they actually showed how the truffle, the small balls are made and everything. And these are the different flavors of Kit Kat. So in Japan, they have a lot of flavors as she was mentioning in the video. So this is the wasabi flavor, I think. So yeah, it's really interesting. And I definitely recommend this. Do visit this if you're in New York. And I'll see you guys the next time. Bye.